we're surrounded. Men of faith who've learned the art of perseverance, we're surrounded. Women of courage who know what it means to face their fear and how it feels to get knocked down, but to now hold their crown of victory. So let's run this race until this race is done. Let's run this race until this race is won. We're running with giants. Good morning, ACC. How's everybody doing? My name is Dustin Pete. I'm, I get to serve as uh, one of the pastors here on staff, and it's, uh, it's a real joy and privilege of mine to be able to speak to you today. I want to welcome those uh, who might be watching online, whether it's live right now or later. Uh, we're so glad that you're watching, and we're so glad that you're here uh, as well in this room. Um, I want to say that this is the first time that I've been able to uh, speak uh, here at ACC since coming on staff back in uh, March, I believe. And so I'm super uh, excited to be continuing on this series. We heard in the first couple of weeks, we're in this series called Running with Giants. And I'm going to explain what that means here in a second. But we heard in the first couple of weeks from Pastor Matt some really great uh, messages. And then last week, we had the privilege of hearing from Zach Gibson uh, continue on this series. And then next week, you're going to hear the best communicator of all, uh, Chris Comstock, is going to be up here next Sunday. And it's going to be one that I, I promise you, you're not going to want to miss. And so I have a question for you. How many of you have something in your life um, that you would say uh, is a goal or something that you want to accomplish or something that's coming up next around the corner that you really want to conquer? Maybe it's as simple as putting in a patio in your backyard or it's as big as getting that promotion at work. Anyone have something coming around the bend that they want to accomplish? Awesome. I think whether I think in all seasons of life, we're either uh, just finishing something um, in the middle of finishing something. Um, or getting ready to start finishing something. And so the great part about this series is that we're taking the Bible, we're taking the truth of God, and we're saying, hey, these are some people that have done some things that we all, all want to do. They've accomplished some things that we all want to accomplish. And so they've gone already and done all these things, and they've been through the hurt, and they've been through the struggle and the journey. And now we get a chance to read uh, their story and get to learn from them and walk alongside them and, they, and their journey, and then we get to learn in our own things and our own goals. Uh, in our first service, uh, a good friend of mine, Will uh, Stineman, um, was in the service. And if you don't know Will, if you've ever, ever been to our community lunch on Tuesday, Will's the one that always seems like he had way too many Red Bulls to drink before he entered a situation. <clears throat> and Will also has this uh, characteristic um, unlike me, where he has a great body. He is built like a Mack truck, and so uh, I decided earlier this year in my life that I wanted to start progressing. A goal of mine was to, to, to gain some traction on my physical health, and so I looked around and I said, okay, is there anyone around here that I would look at and say it looks like they have their physical health under control, and if you've ever seen a picture of Will, it's just shy of Mr. Universe is what he looks like, and so I don't have a desire to have my neck be the same size as my thighs, but I do want um, some physical health and some regularity. And so I talked to Will, I said, hey, Will, looks like you got this health thing figured out, clearly. And so I would love to uh, learn from you what it is that you've been doing that works so well. And so Will was gracious enough to take me over to LA Fitness last Tuesday. My hair still hurts today. Um, he didn't push me too hard. I decided to push myself further than I needed to, needed to go, but... Um, that's just how I do things. And so by spending that 30 minutes to an hour with Will, I was able to learn from him, here's what you don't want to do, and here's what you do want to do, and here are the things that will help you reach your goals, and here are the things that you shouldn't waste your time on. And one of the things that I learned that I'm really, really bummed about, and I'm going to just let you in on a little secret. This one's totally free. has nothing to do with the message today. But if you want to be physically fit, apparently 80% of it has to do with your diet. <laughs> I'm really bummed about that. I'm really bummed about that. If we could just form a support group for that 80% <laughs> after this, might, might want to join my life group this fall. Um, I'm, not, I'm not excited about that. I was really kind of hoping it would be 80% about the exercise and then 20% about the health. I'm like, hey, maybe not eat the whole gallon of ice cream. Maybe only eat half the gallon of ice cream. I could, I could get on board with that. Um, 
but I'm super nervous, so you can be praying for me on that. But it's great to be able to have someone who has gone before me and, and has found the things that have worked and found the things that haven't worked. And instead, instead of me just kind of fumbling around and trying to figure out what's going on and being discouraged because I'm not seeing the results that I want and I'm not achieving the goals that I want to achieve, it's great to have someone who has gone through those things and I can look to them and I can ask them questions and they can pour into me and they can say, here's what you're doing wrong, here's what you're doing right here. I want you to avoid this mistake. I want you to avoid this pain. I want you to avoid this hurt right here because I've already gone through that. It's not worth it. That's not the right way to do it. Here is the right way to do it. And the great part about having someone like that in your life is that that's what we're talking about in this series. These giants that we're talking about running with, it's not, that's not Will, by the way, in this picture. It looks very similar to him. Um, we probably should have got Will for that video. I don't know why we didn't. But we have, the, we have Scripture, and we have these, these giants of our faith is what we're talking about. We have scripture to guide us along in these goals and these things and these different journeys that God is taking us on to help us navigate through things the right way and see things uh, the way that we need to see things and avoid pain and avoid the things that, um, that we know are ultimately not going to lead us to that, to that goal. And so our verse, our, our passage of scripture during this series has been found in Hebrews 12. It says, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses, those are the giants that we're talking about, the giants of our faith. A huge crowd of witnesses to the life of faith. That's um, people like David, like we're going to talk about today, or John the Baptist, like we talked about a few weeks ago, or Esther that we heard, talked about last week. These are all people that even if you're new to the faith or you're new to church or you've never stepped foot in a church before, everybody knows the story of David and Goliath. And so these are people that, you, that you, you may have heard of, and we're going to be able to learn things from them because they have gone on to do some very successful things before us. It says, since we're surrounded by them in Scripture, in the life of faith, let us strip off every weight that slows us down, especially the sin that easily trips us up. Again, this is an opportunity for us to look and see the things that are ahead of us and look at the hurdles that we're going to have to jump instead of having a hurdle just show up in front of you, um, we can look ahead and we can see those hurdles coming and we can prepare to jump over them the right way so that we're successful. It goes on to say this, and let us run with endurance the race that God has set before us. And so that's this idea of running with giants. And so that's great. Well, how, do, how, how do we uh, run with the giants? How do we uh, glean these things? How do we gain um, the proper knowledge and the wisdom and the motivation that we need from, uh, from these people who have gone on and lived a great life of faith before us so that we can do the same. And I love scripture because sometimes when you read it, you're like, God, I don't understand what that means. And in the very next verse, sometimes often in the parables, Jesus will say, look, I know you don't know what this means, so here's what it means. And this is another one of those situations where the Bible, where God tells us, he's like, look, I, I know you don't know how to do this. And so I'm going to tell you in the very next verse, verse two, it says, we do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus. And that's an easy thing to say, a very, very difficult thing to do. Keeping our eyes on Jesus, the champion who initiates and perfects our faith. I want to emphasize that word perfects. If you have your Bibles open or if you have notes written down or anything like that, I want you to write down or underline or highlight that word perfects our faith because that's where we're going to spend the majority of our time today. Does anyone in the room say that they want to be perfect at anything in their life? Is there one thing that you would say that I want to be perfect at? It? I want to be the perfect husband. I want to, you can raise your hand. It's okay. I want to be the perfect husband. I want to be the perfect spouse. I want to be the perfect son or daughter or the perfect uh, employee or the perfect juggler or whatever it is. Everybody has one thing that they say, I want, I want to be really, really good at this. In fact, I, I want to be perfect at this. I want to be I want to, to attain perfection in this one area of my life. We all struggle with that. I know I've struggled with that um, since I was a little kid. I was raised in a family that was kind of half Christian. My mom always uh, took my sister and I to church, and my sister six years older than me, and my dad really didn't at the time uh, want anything to do with the faith. He's since come to know the Lord, which is awesome. Um, but I know when I was growing up, my sister, who again was six years older than me, she was kind of getting into a lot of trouble all the time. And I don't like to toss the word around black sheep, but every, every family has one. And every family, everybody knows one in their life that, that doesn't matter what they do, that person continually uh, makes wrong choices and bad choices. And because of those wrong and bad choices, it affects everyone in their life. 
and, and just I don't understand how come you can't see that what you're doing is wrong. Why don't you just do the opposite? You know, you just want to look at them in the face and say, look, I, I know your instinct is to go this way. Just go that way instead. Like everything that you do, make every day opposite day until you get it right. <laughs> because clearly everything you choose to do is the complete opposite of what you should do. And so everybody has that in their family. And so I had that in my family growing up and I, and, and I saw the pain uh, and the drama that it caused in my house. And so I just decided to, that I was not going to do that. I was going to fly under the radar. There was enough uh, drama in my house growing up as is, and I didn't need to add to that. And so I just flew under the radar and I made perfection my goal. Um, not in grades or anything. I was a C student. But in everything, and just in terms of being in trouble, like I'm going to be the perfect child who doesn't get in trouble. I'm not going to be the like the uh, the honor student, but I'm going to just going to be the perfect child who doesn't get in trouble. And so, because of that perfection that I put on myself, and that led to a lot of self doubt and a lot of um, a lot of guilt and a lot of shame in my life. A lot of people pleasing. Any people pleasers in the house? Where like all you want to do is make everybody happy. You're sick. You need to get you need to get fixed. That's not the message for that but you need fix. Trust me, it's not good. Um, people pleasing will, will ultimately lead you to uh, constant dissatisfaction because people are people. They're the worst um, and they can never be satisfied. There'll always be something that they wish you did that you didn't do. So just stop. And so I, I was always trying to please people and I was constantly dissatisfied uh, with the results because I, no matter what I did, it wasn't good enough. Um, not for my parents, but just for me. And just no matter what I did, it wasn't good enough. And we see that uh, in, in the story in Scripture through King David. And all of us have heard of David. David, the little shepherd boy who beat Goliath with a sling and a stone. And whether you've been in church or not, you know that story. You know that it was a great, um, uh, a great happening, a great uh, uh, folklore, if you will, of, of, of overcoming the odds. And we use it all the time. Uh, you might be watching a football game when, like, the... Cleveland Browns are playing the Patriots, and you're like, it's a David and Goliath story. Well, in that story, Goliath wins. I'm sorry. Like, <laughs> Browns are awful. They're never going to win. They should just accept that. Stop trying to attain perfection, Cleveland Browns. Um, so David, shepherd boy turned hero with a sling and a stone. We know that. He was also God's chosen one to be king. We know that as well, because ultimately we call him, what, King David. So we know that he was chosen to, to be king, but here's where the story gets interesting is that his best friend, Jonathan, his dad already was king. And so imagine your very best friend, um, his dad has the job that God told you you're going to have. That could get a little weird. That could get a little awkward at some point. Well, Jonathan believed David and believed God when God told them that David's going to be king. And so he was just like looking at his dad going, Dad, like this is what's going to happen. You just need to accept it. Well, Dad, Saul, King Saul said, no, I don't accept that. And he tried to kill David, and there was this whole big chase scene. It's a really, really awesome story. You should definitely read First and Second Samuel to hear more about it. But ultimately, Jonathan and Saul end up being killed in battle. And David becomes king over Judah and then ultimately over all of Israel. And so now he has this power that he didn't ask for. It's just what God told him he was going to have. And so now he's uh, ready to start making some mistakes. And this is where we pick up David's story in Second Samuel 11, 2 through 4, it says, late one afternoon, after his midday rest, so Paul's right there, uh, the guy is so rich and powerful that he gets to take naps right in the middle of the day. Anybody else want that? That's power right there. So David got out of bed in the middle of the day, uh, no responsibilities, and he was walking on the roof of his palace. Let's just pause there again. Like, what a power trip scene this is, right? So David just wakes up from his nap at two, um, doesn't have anyone to answer to, and decides he's just going to stroll up to the roof of his palace and overlook everything that he's in charge of as far as his eyes can see. And while he's up there, this is what happens. As he looked out over the city, he noticed a woman of unusual beauty taking a bath. All right, guys, so let's say you're King David, and you own this amazing palace, and you walk up to the roof of it, and you're looking out over all this land that you own, and you're feeling real good, and you're feeling pretty strong, and you're feeling pretty powerful, and you look across the way, and you see the most beautiful woman that you've ever seen taking a bath. What are you feeling like? You're feeling like someone needs to go get that beautiful woman and bring her over here, and that's exactly what David did, and, and he's so rich and so powerful, and, and 
uh, at this point that he doesn't even have to do his own pickup lines. He just sends someone else to do his dirty work, and that's exactly what happened. He says, in verse 3, it says he sent someone to find out who she was. Hey, go find out about that girl over there. And he was told she is Bathsheba. Skip down to verse 4. Then David sent messengers to her again um, to go get her and bring her to him. And when she came to the palace, he slept with her. And what we find out later is that she became pregnant. And then uh, and she was, the, uh, she was the wife of one of his army commanders who were out at battle. And so he tried to cover this up. He's like, this isn't good. This is obviously a bad mistake. It should have been opposite day for me instead of looking at uh, this thing over here and saying, I want that. I should have just turned around and been like, I ain't got time for that. This is a whole mess. I could see this coming, but he didn't see it coming. And so he got this woman pregnant. He tells the commander, her, her husband, hey, come back from battle. You've been working way too hard. You need to come home. Let's just spend, just be with your wife. Come home and be with your wife. And the commander is so devout to the, to the mission at hand. He's so devout to the battle. He says, no, I can't do that. I won't do that until this battle is over. I won't leave my men behind uh, to come home. They don't get to go home and be with their wives. Uh, I'm not going to come home and be with my wife. And David's like, God. All right. Um, I'm going to have to kill you then. And so David sends, <laughs> David sends, out, sends out some people to kill him to cover up the fact that he just got this guy's wife pregnant because he couldn't talk the guy into coming home and getting his own wife pregnant. And so this is a big mess. It's a real big mess. What's amazing is that in spite of all this failure, is that we see in the previous, uh, previous book of the Bible, 1 Samuel and 13, Samuel is a prophet of God, and so he's delivering messages, and he's the one that actually told Saul that David was going to be king, and this is what he says in 1 Samuel 13, 14. He says, but now your kingdom must end. This is Samuel talking to Saul on behalf of God. It says, for the Lord has sought out a man after his own heart. Wait a minute. There's no way he's talking about David. If God knows everything, okay, we all agree with that. God knows everything. He knows everything before it happens. He knows what's going to happen with David. He knows the, the bad choices that David's going to make. And even still, he says, David is a man after my own heart. And this is interesting for a couple reasons. Number one is that nowhere else in Scripture do you hear God tell someone that this man, this person, this other human being is a man, is, is, is so about me and my business that he's a man after my own heart. Nowhere else do we hear in scripture that's that God calls someone else that how can he be talking about the same David who got this woman pregnant and killed her husband to cover it up it's because perfection isn't real and so that's our big idea today is that you don't have to be perfect I just want you to release whatever it is that you have in your life or or, or projections that you're putting on someone else's life for them to be perfect I just want you to release those this morning and drop your shoulders and know that it's okay to not be okay because perfection is impossible. There's only one person uh, who ever lived on this earth who lived a perfect life and, and he did it in such a way that they named uh, our faith after him and it was Jesus. Jesus was the only one who ever walked this earth who was perfect and we'll talk about why in just a second. You don't have to be perfect. Well, maybe, um, maybe you believe that it's all up to you to get it right. That this person and this person, this person, they continually drop the ball. And if I want things to be done, if I want things to be done the right way, then I've got to step it up and I've got to do it. And it's, and it's all up to me. If this whole world uh, stops spinning, it's up to me. The whole, the, 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 the weight of everything rests in the balance of my decisions. I'm here to tell you that's a lie. It's a lie, and here's why. In 2 Corinthians 12, Christ says that my grace is all you need. My power works best in your weakness. So now I'm glad, this is Paul talking, now I'm glad to boast about my weakness so that the power of Christ can work through me. First thing you need to know today is that you don't have to be perfect in order to be protected by God's grace. Anyone ever seen an uh, ugly husband with a really pretty wife? <laughs> Sometimes you see it on TV and you're like, that's not real. And then you realize, no, that's real. It's my life. Like, I'm the ugly husband and my wife is smoking hot. Anyone, anyone feel that way? If you're a husband in the room, just raise your hand and acknowledge, <laughs> I'm trying to help you. 
trying to help you here, okay? This is you we're talking about. That is the image of God's grace. Amen, guys? It's because of his grace. We don't have to be perfect, and we can still get the smoking hot wife. Second thing, you might be thinking that your story is destined for failure. No matter what decisions you make, you know that ultimately it's going to end bad anyway. And I want to tell you that's a lie, and here's why. In Acts 13, we read this, it says, it's talking about Saul again. It says, God removed Saul and replaced him with David. Again, a man about whom God said, I have found David, son of Jesse, a man after my own heart, and he will do everything that I want him to do. Again, we hear, he's a man after God's own heart. He'd go out to battle, slice the dude's head off, and come home and write a poem about it. And that's something that we should, guys, we should aim to be. I was wondering if anyone was going to laugh. Goes on to say, this is important. It says, and it is one of King David's descendants. Who is it? Jesus, who is God's promised Savior of Israel. Listen, God used David not only in David world, in David times, in David life. He not only used him there to, to do his will. He also put him in the biggest story ever. He put him in his own story. And so David was a, descend, uh, was a descendant. David's descendant. Or so Jesus was a def- descendant of David. Sorry. And so without David, if we're looking at he begat this and he begat this and this person had this kid and this person had this kid. In that chain there, okay, is David. And ultimately down that chain is Jesus Christ our Savior. That's, that's a big role to have in the story of God. Also, the biggest book of the Bible, if you know nothing about the Bible and you just kind of open it up sometimes and you're like, I don't know what I'm supposed to read in this thing, but here I'm just going to open it up. Odds are that if you open it up right in the middle, you're going to end up in the book of Psalms. It's the biggest, the, the, bookest, the biggest book of the Bible. It's not the biggest, I promise you. It's the biggest book of the Bible. And David, we know that David, King David, the same guy uh, who was a man after God's own heart and did all these things that were covered in grace, David wrote the majority of those psalms. We know that. You, you'll, you'll see right at the beginning of the psalm, this is a psalm of David, and it's a great little poem about why God's not near me anymore, and then by the end, everything's kumbaya, and it's good to go. And so David not only got to partner by, uh, in, in the lineage of Jesus Christ, but he also got to partner in God's story by, being, uh, by writing and contributing to the biggest book in God's Word. And so the second thing you need to know is that you don't have to be perfect to partner in his story, to partner in God's story. We have to be okay with trading in the little bitty, insignificant, screwed up, destined for failure story of us. We've got to trade that in for the bigger, more successful story of God and what role he wants us to play in that. Maybe, maybe you think that what you've done is too bad to come back from. In Romans 8, 35 through 38 says this, can anything ever separate us from Christ's love? Does it mean he no longer loves us if we have trouble or calamity or are persecuted or hungry or destitute or in danger or threatened with death? And you could probably go on to say if, if they made this mistake and that mistake and if they got this girl pregnant and if they did this drug and they were addicted to this thing and they made this constant bad choice, you could say all those things there. But as scriptures say for your sake, we're killed every day and we're being slaughtered like sheep. No despise, uh, despite all these things, overwhelming victory is ours through Christ who loves us. And I'm convinced, this is a point of underlining right here. I'm convinced that nothing, nothing can ever separate us from God's love. Neither death nor life, nor angels or demons, no fears for today or worries about tomorrow. Not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love. And so the third thing is this, is that you don't have to be perfect in order to be purchased by Jesus' blood. And I want to settle there for a second. If you're new to church or you're new to, 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 to the Christian life and you're trying to figure out what, what, is it, what does it mean, what's, what's your obsession with all this blood talk? It sounds pretty gory, it sounds pretty weird, and I don't understand why we're always singing about the blood. Well, let me explain something to you. In the Old Testament, in the Old Covenant, God required a blood sacrifice to be made 
because people were sinful and he is perfect. And so in order to make that relationship right, he required a blood sacrifice to be made to make that relationship whole again. Why he required that? I have no idea. Is it super weird? Absolutely. I have no idea why he requires that, but he does, and that's, that's the way it is. And so people in that day, they looked around and they said, okay, I have lambs and I have goats and bulls and whatever. And so they would bring their perfect, whatever the best uh, animal um, that they had, they would bring and they would sacrifice it on the altar and they would spill its blood on the altar as a sacrifice to God, saying, God, I want to be made right with you again. Fast forward to the New Testament where, where God says, okay, enough is enough with all these animal sacrifices unless there's cats. We could still sacrifice cats. Okay? We're not going to do that here this morning. No one's going to sacrifice a cat here this morning. You can join Matt's life group if you want to sacrifice cats. Pretty sure they do that. Fast forward to the New Testament where God sends his only son, the perfect one, the one who perfects our faith. And he sends him as the one final sacrifice, the one spilt blood sacrifice. And so Jesus came and he poured out his blood he was beaten to death and put on the cross and blood drained out of his body as the once and for all final sacrifice so that we could be made right with God. And so that's why Jesus' blood is so important. And at the end of this message, we're going to sing a song about it. And you're going to understand that his blood and his sacrifice will never fail you. Never fail you. You know, I've struggled over the past couple of years um, in my battle with depression, I've been able to come through uh, a lot of that through counseling and medication. And if you're struggling with that today, I encourage you to talk to someone about that. But I know that in the end, that God is more concerned about the things that I'm learning about him than about my situation being perfect. And I look around and I, and, and, and I want certain things for myself. I want certain things for my family, for my wife, for my kids. I want a certain house. I want a certain lifestyle. I want certain things to be a certain way. I want perfection in those things. And I know that's not, that's not what God desires. He's not after all that. He's more concerned about what he's teaching us through all the imperfection than he is about us attaining perfection, which isn't real. So there's three things I want to leave you with today. Please write these down. Three things I want to leave you with today. First thing is this. I want you to know that failure is not fatal. Maybe it's you sitting in here where you say, I've, you don't understand what I've done. You, you'll never, you, would, you would be shocked and appalled to understand, to hear the things that I have done. You probably would be. It's not fatal. It's not fatal. You might have someone in your family that you've given up hope on. Don't do it. Don't give up hope on them. Their failure is not fatal. Is it super frustrating, annoying, and does it hurt? Absolutely. But it is not fatal. Second thing is this. This is a tough one. I want you to stop comparing your unfinished business to other people's final product. And this is tough because we live in this age of social media and Facebook and Instagram, and this is where it's the worst. And Facebook and Instagram is not evil. It's an awesome thing to be able to stay connected with some friends that you grew up with who live hundreds of miles away. I know I do. And it's a real blessing to be able to still be able to stay in touch with them. I couldn't do that 20 years ago. It'd be a lot more difficult. But when I see a picture on Instagram of someone's perfection, the perfect vacation, the perfect spouse, the perfect kid, the perfect home, the perfect scenario, I sit and look at that and I go, how come I don't have that? And I think you can agree. A lot of times you allow yourself to think the same way. But what you don't see out of that little bitty frame is the hurt and the struggle and the pain that's really going on in their lives. And maybe their, maybe their teenage daughter just told them that they don't love them anymore. You don't know that. So stop comparing your unfinished business to other people's final product. Last thing is this. I want you to know that when things look grim, uh, the story isn't over. If you're still here today or if the person in your life is still here today um, that is super annoying to you and they're a constant failure in your eyes, if they're still on this earth, you shouldn't give up on them because God hasn't given up on them because if they're still here, their story isn't over yet, no matter how bad it gets, no matter how useless they seem. I've got that person I'm thinking of right now and I know that their story's not over yet. It could be you. 
or it could be someone that's really close to you. Do not give up on them. Do not give up on yourself. Perfection is not real. And we can be covered in Jesus' blood to be made right again. Let's pray together. Father, we're thankful for the life of King David. So screwed up like us. And we know that you give us that story so that we know that perfection isn't real. And that we don't try to do life on our own. And we don't try to go about things as if we don't need you. You show us these things to let us know that we do need you. We need your sacrifice. We need that blood covering our sins in our life. It will never fail us. Failure is not fatal. And you're not done with us yet. In Jesus' name, amen.